name is Dennis Jagodin. I'm uh, working for the organization. It's one profit organization, Teplitsa, Technologies for Social Good, Teplitsa and Russian Union Greenhouse. We are 12 years old and we help uh, Russian civil society and now Russian civil society in, in exile uh, with IT solutions, consultations, any kind of help uh, to make them stronger and more sustainable. So uh, now I will present uh, so our research with my colleagues from other friendly organizations uh, like Mikhail Gipsman from Ariel University and Ilya Rozovsky from Berlin. Uh, we made this research uh, last autumn. We asked uh, uh, nonprofits, grassroots projects, uh, activists uh, that make some anti-war or humanitarian projects and help uh, for the like Russian speaking civil society, for the Ukrainians, Belarusians, and so on. And also this part of this presentation and another uh, part, it's not only research, but also my experience because we help a lot of anti-war activists inside the country, uh, like in exile. So and this presentation is also based on my experience, like working with them and making and helping them with like different uh, tech solutions, cybersecurity, and so on and so on. Uh, so at first, yes, some citation, uh, mainly it's about that uh, we can't do all this alone. And it's about solidarity. And uh, when we were interviewing these projects, all of them talk about solidarity and that we should support each other. Some background. Like, uh, actually, the war in Ukraine, it started not in 2022, but in 2014, when uh, Russia annexed, annexed Crimea. And starting from this time, the Russian civil society, society was under very big and increasing pressure from the state, from the police, from the Kremlin, from the propaganda, and so on. And uh, especially after the like big invasion in, in Ukraine in 2022, uh, a lot of civil society actors, they just left the country because you just can't be still in Russia and make some human rights work, some anti-war activities and so on. So uh, actually a lot of people, they still in Russia and they make this work and a lot of lawyers help them in just inside country, but also there is a very big uh, community of Russian civil society in exile. And uh, they not only help, help the ones who are still in the country, like with the resources, money, just consultations, with the visas and so on and so on. They also, there are a lot of activists, a lot of projects who help uh, not only uh, Russian, but also Ukrainians, like uh, Free Russia, NL, like the projects in uh, France, in Germany, and so on. They help also Ukrainian citizens to who flee their own country because of the war. So, and we are like constantly working with all the, all of these projects, and we see their challenges. And these challenges are not only like where to find money and so on but also how to make their work more effective with their tech, with IT solutions, and how to implement sub cybersecurity into their like, everyday work. Because even if you leave the country, there are still such thing as transnational repressions. When uh, like Russian state uh, tries to reach you outside the country, there, there were cases when they uh, tried to poison some activists or journalists, like it was last year. So, and even if you are out of the country, you still need to be aware of the security issues, to be aware how to protect yourself, your team, and also your beneficiaries who may be inside the country. So, I will tell you about this. And some more about our research. So, we tried to explore the strategies and some cybersecurity practices employed by Russian and also Ukrainian civil society. We tried to make analytics of how in which technology supports the initiatives and also we 
try to provide insights into the resilience and adaptability of these groups, how they like, how they work with the challenges, how they change since they started and so on. Uh, late uh, this month, there will be a publication of this research. So I will share with the society later. Okay, next slide. Okay, we made a lot, a lot of interviews, like Ukrainian projects, like Russian projects, helping Ukrainians or Russians, or just people who need help because of the war, this uh, like big scale war. We had questionnaires, we made interviews, okay, and uh, yes, yeah, so there was about 10 like interviews with these projects. And the spectrum of these, the projects, initiatives, and actors of civil society, like a lot, a, a lot, a lot of different kinds, like and uh, projects that help uh, with the like therapists for uh, especially this is very useful for Ukrainian refugees. Okay, the centers that help refugees. Okay, and maybe some informational services. Uh, there are uh, projects that help evacuate like Russian activists from Russia, uh, which help um, to uh, evacuate Ukrainians from Russia because some Ukrainians who like ran from the war, not on the West, but on the East, and they are in, the, in Russia, so they are trying to go back to their country or just maybe to like to Western countries and they still need some help with documents, with uh, transport, with uh, visas and so on to leave the country. Some projects help with this. And like we also interviewed some independent media outlets who also write a lot about these projects. Uh, one of the like main insights was the projects that they told that their main purpose is to make the activities no longer necessary. So they, when we ask where do they see themselves in five years, they told that okay, we, we hope like we'll that they will be doing some other stuff, not like civil society, but maybe some some want to go to business or academic so on. But they hope that they will not longer be necessary. So now let's talk more about the technology. So when we ask these projects, and also I see from my like day-to-day -day work with these uh, activists, uh, their job, uh, their projects, they could be, it would be very difficult to implement them without any kind of technology, especially a lot of them um, said that at, the, at first, at their first steps, and most of this initiative, they started just from the beginning of the big scale war, most of them could be impossible just without Zoom or Google Meet, because uh, most of them are uh, like teams are from different countries. Some of them are still inside Russia, like in Europe, like Georgia, like some are in the Turkey. And uh, without this communication tools, they just couldn't make all their job. So. And uh, if we speak like more about tools, so uh, they use a, lo a lot of like uh, social media platforms, uh, but in Russia, uh, now the main social media platform actually is a Telegram messenger because uh, Facebook messenger, it's like a, a bubble, information bubble for the, the civil society actors. And it's difficult to reach some people, just ordinary people. And uh, the main, another main Russian social network, Kontakti, uh, it's very censored. censored. Uh, you can't po make post about like war, about helping Ukrainians, about maybe some anti-war posts, they will be banned and uh, you may be prosecuted after this. So the main media platform in Russia is Telegram and uh, a lot of projects, they started like with the zero subscribers and now they have like 10,000, 50,000, even some of them like uh, help desk, this project, it's named help desk. They have like more than 100,000 subscribers. So uh, another technology, technology is chatbots uh, with the 
the start of the Bitscale War, the chatbot, they got the like the second chance in civil society because it's not a new technology. Like we all of us saw chatbots like in the early like like 2010, 2015. But uh, this project they used them for consultations for um, answering uh, like uh, people who need some help. We like interpret it personally. Um, may help to develop the framework which uh, connects chat like open source uh, chatbots technology and help desk technology so they can uh, implement them in telegram in whatsapp maybe in some other messengers so and uh, for the last year especially like last few months a lot of this project they started implementing ai so they're trying to make their work more effective and uh, all of them are struggling because of the lack of the financial help, lack of the like human resources. Uh, many of them working with volunteers and uh, this AI approach helps them to make work more effective or it's just this bots with the AI, they answer the questions or maybe some of them are helping like people on the line, uh, volunteers in this project to answer the question like faster, more effective. They help to look for some information in like the databases. And also they use this chatbots inside teams a lot like for logistics or maybe automating communications. As I said before, the messaging and video conference apps, they also uh, used a lot by the like, diaspora in exile and they, uh, but Mm, the first time there was some issues because like Zoom first and some other video video tools, video conference apps, they were banned, not inside Russia, but the developers by themselves, they banned these tools inside country. And so we helped uh, many projects to implement like open source self-hosting solution like Jitsi, Mattermost, like element matrix like uh, big blue button is the fork for the jitsi so and uh, now mostly all of these projects they have some i don't know some some establishments some maybe even like like uh, teams inside europe who help them with the uh, pain for the zoom for the google meet and so on but still many of them using this open source and self-hosting solutions. And uh, this are uh, not only because of the, I don't know, like the money and expenses, but also because of the anonymity, anonymity because of the security. So as you know, if you update this open source solution, like every time, so they are sometimes more secure than maybe some commercial solutions. Also, some of these projects, they make these frameworks to funnel money inside countries to support activists. So it may be, uh, it doesn't look good, like this expression to funnel money. I even uh, sometimes use the expression uh, money laundering for good. But uh, inside countries, inside Russia, all the money that we get from the donors, from the Western supporters, they almost all are illegal and you can get the status of foreign engine, foreign agent. You can get this, the status of the undesirable organization that is very bad in, inside country. So, and there is a lot of requests uh, of how to uh, stream the money inside country and make it uh, with anonymity and make it with the security for the activists inside country. So we like helping them to, we teach them how to use like uh, crypto, how to use the crypto for anonymity and so on. Uh, some teams that we interviewed and the others that I worked with that we helped, they use task managers. They didn't uh, use them from the beginning, but at some stage they knew that they need to make their projects more organized and they using task managers like uh, Trello, for example. Some of them use like uh, Asana. And we help them just explaining that they can ask 
like TechSoup or Google for nonprofits for some discounts or there are cases when like this big tech even uh, give some like free access for their services for their not like even for the uh, Russian civil society in exile. And also the big part is the VPNs. Uh, we advise them not only when you are connected to someone inside country, but just use it every day, especially if you're in uh, like cafes, you're using Wi-Fi in hotels and so on. And uh, it's good, as you know, for anonymity. And sometimes it's good for accessing, accessing the restricted uh, website because sometimes these projects, they need access to the websites inside country. But these websites, they uh, don't allow anyone from IP addresses outside Russia. So they also use VPNs. And there is such a, uh, we like this project, we help them with the starting. It's a, a generator VPN. Uh, this is project by Mikhail Primarov. Uh, they just uh, give the free access to VP VPN to the people inside Russia because uh, they and we think that the, uh, you should give the access to the free information for everyone in the same country. And they, as I know, they already gave about 100,000, 150,000 free VPNs for the people inside the country. Okay, I see that not a lot of time is left, so I will fast forward. And also about some about some cybersecurity practices. Uh, these projects use a lot of like data obfuscation, anonymity techniques. They will use a lot of anonymiz anonymization because they need sometimes to remove their names, addresses, and so on. They use a lot of uh, security protocols, and we help them with the training with these protocols, like. Which, uh, how to prepare devices, how to use multi-factor authentication, how to install your own VPNs. So uh, another practices, um, they try to use a lot of like secure messaging platforms and there are a lot of them, but the main are Signal, Element, or Matrix. It's uh, the same technology, Delta Chat, Simplex Chat, CryptPad. And uh, also self-hosted solution, as I told before, like Rocket Chat, Nextcloud, or Jitsi. Uh, they use a lot of VPNs and other infrastructures, and they use a lot of encrypted storage solutions, like mostly the open source, but also the commercial ones also use. And uh, okay, I have one minute. And the main challenges and barriers for these projects are like lack of specialist expertise. And this is where we in Teplice, we help them. We help them with the cybersecurity, with the digital transformation, with like consulting on all kinds of tech tools. If, if we can do this, we ask the, the volunteers. We have the big community of IT volunteers who help nonprofits and also anti-war projects. Uh, another barrier is the cost of security because it's important not only to know about them, but to implement them. Sometimes it requires money, maybe to host your own like solution or something like this. Resource allocation, it's like the main issue for all of us. And also dependency on social media platform, because for example, a couple of weeks ago, YouTube, which is still available inside Russia, it blocked few of the opposition and anti-war uh, channels. So the, we, with the access now, we like wrote this letter and another project supported us and YouTube just un unblocked it. But this was like very strange and not very good case. We t yes, we're trying to communicate with Google, but as you know, it's not so easy to communicate with big tech. And so I guess there's no time. I'm out of the time. So just if you have, have any questions, ask me and I will tell you more about like how Russian diaspora in exile, Russian civil society, and also the ones inside country use like technology, use the security tools, how they use and which security protocols they use. Okay, so thank you. And these are my how you can find me.